Um, so the, the second session was on uh, L2 and VM selection. Um, I suspect we're gonna get uh, sort of brief presentations from a number of L2 providers who are here. Um, I know, uh, first of all, there is uh, some, a couple of people here from Axiom who have been researching uh, into uh, proof systems and, um, and circuits that could be used to design a EVM or uh, namespace specific roll up that would be much lighter weight to compute and could have a number of advantages for us. Um, where are you guys? Do you want to, uh, do you want to kick it off and, and give us a brief high level overview of what you've been putting together? Uh, microphone behind you. Uh, yeah, I can just talk or I have like two slides. Um, yeah, basically what we've been exploring at Axiom is a way to really approach a rollup for ENS that is much more minimal and in particular removes EVM support in order to get a couple benefits. So maybe to talk through the criteria that we're thinking through and the possible advantage of, is of this, we think that the, there are three uh, high level ways in which a rollup for ENS should differ from a general purpose rollup. Uh, well, it's being set up just as a, as a backgrounder because my own knowledge of, of ZK roll-up constraints was, was not very complete until recently. The reason we're even considering this, uh, ZK-based roll-ups have some fairly high overhead in terms of generating proofs. Uh, depending on the roll-up, depending on what, what uh, degree of EVM compatibility it provides, uh, proofs can take multiple hours to generate on one or even a cluster of fairly powerful machines. Uh, proving costs can amount to as much as you know, six figures per month in terms of uh, compute costs. Uh, and the latency, uh, to, to, therefore, to find finality can range from one to several hours while those proofs are being generated. Uh, in some cases, L2s are committing every hour, but it takes multiple hours to generate proofs, so they then have multiple provers operating in parallel. Potentially, a, uh, a much more constrained uh, ENS-specific roll-up could have proofs that are orders of magnitude faster to compute than that, which means that we could commit as often as we want, which is you know something we can get with more or less any L2, but then we could be finalizing extremely quickly, which means we could offer that best of both worlds option. Um, and alongside that, it could have significantly lower infrastructure costs, which would make it easier to decentralize our infrastructure um, and easier to build, you know, basically the whole ecosystem around it. We could have potentially a very lightweight uh, VM. The flip side is that then uh, we have to build a lot more infrastructure, or somebody does anyway. Sorry, back to you. Can you hear me now? Great. Yeah, so as Nick outlined, there are a couple trade-offs here between going with EVM or not EVM. And so the way we were brought to thinking about this is that ENS has a lot of criteria for rollup that are pretty weird and not really what general purpose rollups want. So the three we found that are most salient are fast finality. So here, because the resolution is ideally starting from L1, uh, the finality latency really impacts how quickly users can update their names. And we think also that this finality should have the highest possible security level, uh, which can be provided by ZK proof. Uh, the second is censorship resistance, uh, namely that the ideal standard would be for uh, any user operations to have the same level of censorship resistance as they have today, namely L1 transaction inclusion. And the last thing is less concrete, but we think that the system should minimize the admin rights. And so the way to do this is a bit fuzzier, but broadly we want to minimize the security surface area of a solution to enable the system to avoid uh, the usage of an admin multisig, uh, which is a feature of essentially every rollup today for security reasons. Uh, the main reason is that if something goes wrong, you do kind of need an admin to stop that. Uh, but ideally for ENS, this would be avoidable. Uh, Google seems to not allow me to go full screen unless I have internet access, which 
Somehow I don't. Yeah, it seems grayed. Let me see if there's... Um, yeah, maybe I'll, I'll continue. Um, okay, so, so what's the reason that these are actually hard to achieve within an EVM context? Um, so if we're going down the path of a ZK rollup, uh, fast finality is hard just because proving EVM in ZK has a lot of overhead. The EVM is a pretty complex system and verifying it just has greater cost. And then actually for censorship resistance, there's a greater issue, which is that the major pathways to uh, enforcing censorship resistance in ZK are forced inclusion on L1 or based sequencing. And both of those require simulation of the EVM within an on-chain context. And so that's pretty difficult to do and it gives some liveness risk when implementing the censorship resistance mechanisms. And finally, just because the EVM is pretty complex, uh, there's some implementation complexity which intrinsically increases the security service area. And so broadly, the main challenge of all these is just the generality of the EVM. And so what we've been exploring is to a, a way to address these issues with a more minimal approach to an ENS rollup. So just to give a quick summary of what we're thinking, we would maintain an ENS-specific rollup state, which would be finalized on L1 somewhat frequently. But we would minimize the state transition function to support only state transitions that correspond to the transactions available for ENS. So things like commit, register, renew, transfer, uh, set record, or set resolver. And in particular, we would not allow composition of arbitrary EVM calls. To verify this state transition, we would create a modular ZK virtual machine, which really attempts to minimize the set of dependencies. So the goal here would be to, as much as possible, associate the logic of the ZKVM with the specific application logic that ENS needs. And the idea here is to enable forced inclusion on L1 uh, from day one in the bridge. So in terms of these criteria, uh, we think that there's, the, the benefits are that because we're removing so many things from the roll-up state transition function, um, it's gonna be faster and cheaper to actually prove these in ZK. And moreover, we can minimize the security surface area because we're only putting things in the virtual machine that are actually necessary to execute this smaller application logic. And same thing for censorship resistance. Uh, we think it's gonna be possible to have forced inclusion on L1 um, just because we have less complexity on the ZK side. And finally, uh, we think that by minimizing the feature set to exactly what ENS wants, uh, we can allow the security surface area to be small enough that the admin rights can be reduced in a faster way. And so the general theme here is that by reducing the scope, uh, we think that ENS can actually achieve just its objectives um, more quickly than using a more generic system. Now I wanna call out that there are a couple challenges here, uh, mostly driven by the fact that um, this is not an EVM compatible system. Uh, the first, as we discussed just in the last session, uh, is that CCIP read proofs would need to be done using Merkle proofs into the rollup state instead of uh, EVM state proofs. But things would work pretty similarly, honestly. It's just that there would be some differences in the actual state format. Uh, the latter two, I think, are actually the most significant ones, which would be wallet and explore and indexer support. Uh, basically, because this would be a custom rollup format, uh, there would be integration uh, problems to solve on the transaction format, as well as allowing users to you know, look at the state of the rollup, index the rollup, things like that. Um, so yeah, just wanted to kick, kick, up this, kick off the discussion with that. Would love to hear any feedback from anyone and whether uh, this is interesting to the community. Uh, if I can just sort of boundary set a couple of sort of expectations around this, uh, which are flexible, but my first thoughts on what something like this would look like. Uh, we would not, most likely not be trying to have pricing oracles inside this minimalist roll-up. Instead, we would have some sort of utility token that represents you know, a day of registration of a five plus character name. You would 
purchase that on the L2 of your choice before sending it to the roll-up. The roll-up would need to track balances of that token in order to do registration, but we don't then have all the infrastructure of trying to maintain oracles and so forth inside this minimal roll-up. Um, pretty much all of the V2 L1 infrastructure would remain the same. The general, like the recursive registry design would remain the same and so forth. But of course, the L2 infrastructure would be a, a complete uh, change in order to fit this, this roll-up architecture. Um, the general sort of lookup process, though, would remain very similar in terms of using Merkle proofs to do recursive lookups across registries. But those registries would be implemented at sort of the OS layer of this, this roll-up, more or less. Uh, so, sorry to interrupt, over to the many people who had questions. Uh, I think over the mic. One, one question is about like that wallet support, like that feels like almost like the, the hardest management piece, right? Is it like, so if ENS is about a lot of humans using it, it's already got a lot of integrations, like this is gonna mean that basically all of those wallets and anyone that wants to uh, implement ENS in the future is gonna have to not, is gonna have to build something custom as opposed to like a copy paste EVM yeah, our thinking on the wallet integration is that it may be possible to embed transactions in this new roll-up format in a standard EVM format. So the idea would be to maintain support for things like MetaMask, um, just changing the RBC node, Interesting. Uh, the RBC URL. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so it's a bit of a hack, but we could basically have a, an RPC endpoint that pretends that the token is an ERC20 token at a particular address, and then when you send a transaction to it, actually sort of unwraps and, and interprets it and so on. Hey, sorry, um, you need to excuse my ignorance with uh, everything NS uh, related, but I, I, I kind of agree with the minimal roll-up in the sense that uh, it could be something that just does, just does one thing, that's the one thing that we care about, which is resolving these names. Uh, okay, it's alive. Um, yeah, I was thinking like um, that Unchain basically just stores the root and uh, where we would say uh, if there's a user, then it's at the specific index, otherwise it's just not. So it's very easy to check if there is a membership at that specific index. Uh, and so this operator is act would actually just do a very, 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 very simple thing, which is the sparse Merkle tree membership proof. Uh, I was initially not thinking about this because I didn't think having off-chain data was a possibility, but then with CCIP, it definitely is. So you could definitely store this Merkle tree, this Merkle tree, the raw data um, off-chain on a decentralized storage or something, and then use this operator to check membership. Um, so it seems like it could be very, very, very minimal. And it seems like um, if there is a, an incentive alignment and this is something that um, could be discussed uh, to operate these operators, um, then it seems like a very good solution instead of just choosing a general purpose L2 for this. I don't know, what's your view on this? Um, well, about the uh, wallet integration point, we could use uh, an architecture similar to um, what uh, the Aurora EVM uses in NIR or like Kakarot in, in StarkNet context, where you have a EVM a blockchain running inside another VM blockchain, right? So you have uh, uh, this RPC that is kind of like a, a translator, right? And then for the wallet, ex wallet experience, you send uh, EVM-like transaction and then this RPC kind of like decodes and translates to the, the native uh, 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 blockchain transaction that is not EVM, right? So, yeah. Yeah, I think we'd want to offer 
two RPC formats, one being an EVM emulation, and then when one being something more native. And so in the long run, we, the hope would be that others would build into the native RPC format, but in the transitional stage, and probably for the foreseeable future, uh, many people would want to use the EVM format. Um, I, I think, you know, to, to echo your comment, uh, there is a lot to recommend this because we can get exactly the trade-offs we need. Um, and, you know, a lot of the, the things we prioritize, like fast finality, are not easily achieved in ZKVMs at the moment, um, although some are doing a lot better than others. Um, my main concern is just the additional implementation risk we expose ourselves to, because while there are several parties out there who can build something like this, um, and, you know, Axiom are here with us and are, are very engaged with the process, there is still the sort of the vendor risk of, like, we are going from something that half a dozen mature exist, or at least semi-mature ex uh, solutions exist for, to sort of unexplored territory. Not entirely unexplored, but at least less well mapped. Um, and then we're also taking on additional implementation burden in terms of indexing and uh, explorers and so forth. Uh, on the flip side, an explorer for this is not Etherscan. You know, Etherscan is immensely complex and does a great job of providing insight into transactions which are a lot more complex than this would be. You know, I kind of view this as much closer in complexity to say Bitcoin than it is to the EVM. You know, it would be a basic VM that is focused on one task. Yeah, maybe I have a question. Like, what would um, the user flow look like if you want to register, trade a domain? I think you mentioned that it would be through another L2, but so, I guess you need to wait for this L2 to finalize before, uh, like, who would it look like to send back the information in the specific rollup, and what uh, what are the implications in terms of finality? Yeah, I think uh, I think it would look like first you have to acquire registration tokens on on ENS L2, and you can do that a number of ways. You know, basically the same ways that existing L2s bridge to each other. So you can do it the trustless way by you know, buying and issuing those tokens on L1, or you can buy them off someone who already has them on the L2 and will, will send them to you and so on. Uh, doing that totally trustlessly will rely on uh, waiting for the finality of the L2 you're on, but we already see in, you know, with current L2s bridges that rely on uh, you know, the bridges trusted, but if you're buying 50 bucks worth of registration tokens and you want them in five minutes or less, maybe you're willing to take that risk. Um, once you've acquired them, then you'd use that on the EVML, the ENSL2 to do your registration and so on. And since fast finality would be our goal there, that should be very fast. Uh, quick question. So I understand the benefits of minimizing the number of actions that you have to verify. Um, let's say ENS wants to add a new type of action. Um, is that possible? And what is the process for that if we're minimizing admin rights? Yeah, so the idea is, it, first of all, it would be possible. Um, basically, the way that the rollup would be developed in, in so far as verifying the state transition function is modular. Um, so we think of each transaction type as something akin to a uh, function in the existing Solidity code. And so the addition of that would be parallel to that. Now, in terms of updating the rollup, uh, that would proceed through governance. So the idea is that there's two types of admin rights you can have on a rollup. One is a multi-sig that is able to act without a governance vote. Um, that's what's necessary today to halt any rollups for security risks. Uh, the other is for an upgrade for the rollup, which we think should go through governance, and that'd be similar to upgrading um, parts of ENS today. So that would that go through the DAO or something else? That, we, we would leave that up to the DAO. Okay, yeah. I have no idea how that would work. No, I was going to say, I, I think the sort of cost and finalities of the ZK EVMs are a little overstated. Like, if you go on L2 beat today, like, the sort of L1 cost per L2 transaction for linear is like a tenth of a cent. Like, it's already cheaper than optimistic rollups, and you have, like, 20, 30 of the best engineers and researchers trying to, like, squash that down even further. Like, absolutely, the off-chain costs are still, like, large. It's a much more larger proportion of the overall, like, cost overhead. But again, like there's like very like tangible ways to like squash that down such that you can the sort of difference between a ZK VM, like in this sort of co-processor format and a ZK EVM built from the sort of like 
bare ground up is going to be like pretty small like in a couple of years. So I think like for the sort of longevity of ENS, having that compatibility with like MetaMask and other wallets, being able to expand to other use cases whilst the costs are like less of a problem. And even the finality today, like for us, it's about an hour to generate an aggregated proof that's going to get further and further down. So you still have that fast finality. I feel like it's a more future proof solution and like still gives you that EVM equivalence to like run, you know, any sort of eth Ethereum client that you want to and have compatibility with all the tools and all the sort of account abstraction stuff that's coming out. So that would be my, I actually think like what you propose is a really credible path forward for a lot of different projects. My feeling for ENS is like it's still probably better for like a, a ZK EVM that's like really hyper focused on getting those costs down and getting that finality down. Yeah, maybe in like a similar essence as well, like the future proofing, is that like one of my thoughts is like sort of the unknown unknowns of what like ENS chain could be used for and like, you know, a more generalized EVM sort of obviously lends into those unknown unknowns a lot more versus this of like it's, it's hyper focused, which means it can be really effective, but like how, you know, what can be built on top of this chain, you know, in some end state is less. Yeah, I just want to say I have similar thoughts of like, I'd be worried about what are we accidentally cutting ourselves off from. And then if we do want to go modular and add new things, is that, that's whole another layer of admin on top of that. But maybe we need that anyway. I don't know how these things work. Yeah, I think there's a fundamental trade-off between flexibility and extensibility and the pace of that and the ability to make things more immutable and more ossified. So I think that's sort of a choice as to which direction on that spectrum ENS wants to be. I think if you want to remove admin rights and be more ossified, then obviously it's harder to actually upgrade and add features, and, or, and also harder to support something that's more flexible, um, like the full EVM. So I think it's kind of a fundamental choice that DAO needs to make on which side of that spectrum to land on. I had some various points in relation to things that various people have said. Neto mentioned the RPC call conversion potentially adds little bits of latency. The stuff about getting uh, tokens or, or registering names and flows adds a, a user experience on onboarding um, issue, in my opinion. Um, and then I'm, I'm intrigued about timelines and the realities of executing something like this. Um, there's obviously all these client integrations and there's a lot of processing complexity involved there. I'm assuming this has been proposed and discussed because this is something that Axiom technology that technologically can do and can build um, or an, another entity potentially. Um, but yeah, does it have any uh, time considerations in delaying the, the roadmap for um, the, the general timelines that have been put out there for the B2? And I guess, um, why is this preferential to uh, using a well-supported um, uh, stack like the, the various ones that have been discussed, like Optimism and Arbitrum, um, that, as I understand, are moving in the direction and working with various ZK-aligned um, entities to uh, bring proving um, with ZK tech uh, to those already existing and um, well-reputed um, uh, long-standing large TVL chains. I know Risk Zero, for example, uh, in the context of Optimism and their, their multi-prover for their new fault-proof stuff, they're working on ZK stuff so that you can um, prove execution with ZK proofs. And I think they've got a proof of concept for that. Uh, it's just the cost. Um, that's, that's the issue at the moment, but the, the speed at which this stuff is developing, um, I don't think we need to reinvent the wheel. I, I guess the, yeah, I, well, fundamentally what this points at is that we need a, we need several orders of magnitude improvement in finality, uh, or, or in, in resources or finality, or we need a, an enormous unlock to justify the change. It's not necessarily the case that that's, or I should say, it, that may well be the case. You know, at the moment, the state of the art with ZKVMs, not ZK EVMs, uh, with Risk Zero and SP1 and so forth, is that they boast that they're only a million times slower than than native execution of that VM. Um, so, you know, definitely there is room for improvement here, but there are also very high overheads. You know, we could potentially something like this uh, can. You know, if, if we can get it to the point of uh, 
finality in minutes using resources that are low enough that they can easily be decentralized. We could have a, a special purpose chain that finalizes every five minutes and in an entirely decentralized fashion, you know, without a, with a decentralized sequencing, which would be, uh, you know, alongside the, the reduced admin rights and so on, could be enough to justify the additional work and uh, of having our own non-EVM chain. I think we asked Axiom to try and bring some numbers, but we gave them very, very little time in which to do so. Um, so I believe that's still a work in progress. Yeah, we're working on it. We think we can get to single digit minutes for sure. I just don't want to present something we, we can't fully stand behind. Um, and I will say actually, I, I don't think actually the biggest advantage here is performance. I actually agree that actually there's a lot of work going on in ZK and performance for generic ZK VM will probably continue to drop. Uh, but I think that the advantage is more for ossification and censorship resistance, uh, mostly in the ability to enable forced inclusion in a much more rapid time frame, and also the ability to ossify the protocol. Uh, uh, we're just about out of time before the break. Uh, time I'm sorry, for maybe one, second. one or two more things. Do we want to ossify the protocol? Is that an advantage right now? I don't think, personally, I don't think total ossification is ever desirable or achievable, but I think limiting admin rights and limiting sort of censorship, increasing censorship resistance and limiting interference is always a good goal. And reducing surface area does that. Yep, um, awesome. So we're gonna take the break uh, as planned and we're gonna set the next session to be L2 focused. So we'll let the VM part run long, some awesome conversation. So right now, we have 10 minutes to take a break. So if you'd like to use the restroom, it's downstairs and then downstairs again, stairwell along that back wall. Feel free to grab snacks, drinks, and then we'll be back up here at 1135.